Elevate. Welcome. My name is Tim. I'm the lead pastor here at Elevate Life Church. Welcome to our 2.30 service, our final service of the weekend. And uh, we're glad you're here. Come on, God saves the best until last. So you pick a good service to show up at. If you're new, we're, we're so excited to be able to host you today. We kicked off last week a brand new series called Summer School. And uh, sorry about that, but you, we, we, we're sending you back, back to school. Pastor Dusty Brown kicked us off last week with a great message, yeah, about the arithmetic of grace. So unfortunately, we had to learn some math. You know, I'm sorry about that. And uh, if you missed it, I would tell you to watch online, but you're not going to watch because you don't want to learn any math. I, I know you don't like having to go back to school for math. Today, uh, no math involved today, y'all. Uh, we're going to go to art class today. And if you have, but which, by the way, like how, how, how messed up is it if you, if you fail art and have to go to summer school for art? You know what I'm saying? Like, you, you don't even hardly have to show up to pass art class. You need like a pulse to pass art class. Uh, we're we're going to jump into that in a second. Uh, the, the premise behind the series is just um, that, uh, that God, uh, God's always leading us from course to course, level to level, and he's teaching us things. And what I found about God is that God really will. He will send you to summer school if you, don't, if you don't learn the lesson and if you don't pass the test. Not to punish you, but because he wants to prepare you. There are things you need at this level to prepare you for the next one. And, uh, and you know, sometimes, they'll, sometimes in school they will pass you just because you're old. Or they're just tired of dealing with you. And they will pass you. But God will, God will keep, he is long-suffering, which means he'll keep you in the class. Like, you, most of us would be like, I'm done with this one, just send him on. And God will be like, no, he needs to get what he needs to get. He needs to learn what he needs to learn. And some of us are like, I don't know why I keep going through what I'm going through. I, I, I keep facing the same thing. It might be because you're not learning the lesson for that season. And, uh, and God, by his grace, keeps slipping you the, the test over again, bringing you back to summer school, teaching the same lesson. And so, uh, so summer school is all about maybe missed lessons, failed courses, um, uh, maybe something that we didn't get all, everything that we needed to. And God is giving us some remediation. And today we are going to go to art class. More specifically, we're going to, uh, we're going to sculpting class pottery class. Uh, one of my favorite texts, Jeremiah chapter 18, the prophet Jeremiah has been sent to give some, some messages to the nation of Israel, and, and his messages are a mixed bag. In fact, they're honestly, most of them are negative uh, in their content, in the sense that God is pronouncing coming judgment on the nation of Israel. Israel has forsaken God. They've adopted wicked practices. And, uh, and now the, the seeds, if you will, that they have sown are about to be reaped in a harvest that will include the destruction of Jerusalem, the, uh, the leveling of the temple, and the exile of God's people. And so there's some really hard things that are coming down the line in the near future for Israel. But along with that, Jeremiah will sprinkle in these words of affirmation and hope that even though things are about to get really, really bad, the bad things that are coming will not be the final word for the people of God. And can I tell you that the same is true for you and for me, that, um, that, that everything in life that comes our way is not going to be positive. But the Bible does say that God works all things together for good, which means everything is not good, but when God is done, it's going to be good, which means if it's not good, God's not done. And so Jeremiah prophesies and says some really bad things are coming, but after all of those things, God is still going to do what he promised to do in his people. And this is one of those prophecies, Jeremiah chapter 18. We'll read just a few verses together, beginning with verse 1. It says, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. So God gives him a word. The word of the Lord said, the word of the Lord is, is coming. God said, I'm going to say something to you. I want to I tell you something. 
it seems redundant. It would be like me calling you up and being like, hey, uh, I'm, I'm going to call you later. Bye. <laughs> you called me to tell me you're going to call me? You gave me a word to tell me you're going to give me a word? Yeah. But the word that I want to give you, you can't, you can't get it where you are. You got to go down to the potter's house to get this word. Some revelation requires relocation. Another way to say it is sometimes it's hard to hear God here. I, I, I don't know about your house, but sometimes my house, I got four kids, man. Sometimes it's hard to hear here. <laughs> sometimes if somebody calls me, I have to step outside. And I, and I would just offer to you that, that there are some environments that are more conducive than others to hearing from God. And the good news is, come on, you came to the house today and you got in position to hear God here. I'm not saying that he can't speak to you at home, but sometimes, sometimes I've got to relocate in order to connect and hear from God. And so he says, if you'll go down to the potter's house, I'll be able to speak something to you and show something to you there that you can't see here. Verse three says, so then I went down to the potter's house and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again to another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. And then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. God says, go to the potter's house, and there I'm going to make you to hear some words. I've got some words to speak. It, you know, sometimes when you start a course, particularly if it's an area of study that uh, you may not have any experience with, sometimes the first, one of the first lessons that they'll give you is, is a survey of key vocabulary. Because some of the things you study, if, if you're going to understand what we're talking about, you got to understand some of these key terms. And so I want to share with you um, six words. If you're going to understand this relationship between the potter and the clay, between God and his people, there are six things you got to understand. So my title today is just simply six words from the potter's house. Now, if you are new here, you, you might be like, cool, 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 cool. Six words from the potter's house. That's going to be cool. If you're not new here, you're a little bit worried. I can see you're worried because you know I normally have like two points and still go too long. Two points too long. And now you're doing math like six points and it's 307.46. And you're like, I don't even know if I'm going to get to dinner tonight. But here's the key. Help, help me help you people who've been here for a minute know this. If you say amen, my assumption is you understand, you got it, I can move on. If you stay quiet, my assumption is you don't, you don't understand what I'm saying and I just need to keep saying it another way. Amen? amen? See, you got it. Six words from the potter's house. Before we jump in, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. As we, as we hear your words, I believe that every one of us, God, that there might be a word for every one of us. Maybe a singular thing that you want us to hear above everything else that we hear today. And so my prayer today is that as we hear all of these words, that we will hear the word of the Lord. And that we'll not only hear it, but that we'll believe it. And that we'll not only believe it, but we'll do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah. Go down to the potter's house. And, and verse 3 says, so I went down to the potter's house. In fact, let's go ahead and jump in. The first word from the potter's house is humility. So I went down to the potter's house. Now, Jeremiah is describing uh, an, an actual physical reality, a topographical reality. Jerusalem sits on a mountainside, on a hill. And so many times when you're traveling in Jerusalem, depending on where you're going, you are either going up or going down. Jerusalem itself, whenever you go to the temple, the temple is the highest elevation. Um, and so, and so if you, a lot of times they'll say, uh, you're talking about ascending, the Psalms of Ascent are when you go up to the temple. But the potter's house 
was a place where Jeremiah had to uh, go down, literally, physically go down. Uh, And while that was a physical reality, I think it's also a spiritual truth that if you want to hear from God, you are going to have to assume a posture of humility, that we have to lower and abase ourselves. We must decrease and he must increase because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And a part of hearing from God is, is adopting this kind of humble attitude because the, the underlying message and the overarching message of the potter's house, if we could break this whole text into just a phrase, it is simply that God is the potter and we are the clay. And there is a level of humility that is required in hearing that word. Because to acknowledge that word, we have to recognize our place in the world. We have to understand who we are and who we're not, what we are and what we're not. You know, if we, if we were, there's a lot of different ways you can divide things up. You can label things and categorize things. But I think the first categorization In fact, if we look at the book of Genesis and the creation story, the creation narrative, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and all these other things. The the, the, the most basic form and the most basic way to categorize is that in everything in the world, whether material or immaterial, whether things present or things past or things to come, everything in the world can fall into two categories. There is creator and there is creation. There is... There is God, and there is everything else. And so so humility is recognition that there is a God, and I'm not him. There is a potter, but I'm clay. There is a maker, but I am a made thing. I had a start. I'm not eternal. I will have an end. My life began, and it's going to come to an end, my life on this earth. In fact, the Bible says, from dust we came And to dust, we will return. I I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 103, 14. He himself knows our form. He remembers that we are but dust. He knows what we're made of, but oftentimes we forget. Nothing creates a humble heart like remembering that we are not just dust, (laughs) but dust. That just sounds nasty. Like nothing, when, you, when you're starting to feel like you're some, you're starting to feel like you're somebody, just remember that you are butt dust. And I don't want to be butt dust. Right? I, I want to think sometimes more highly of myself. That I, I, I want to, I wanna, even though I know on, on some level, I, I, I know that, that I, I came from nothing. Naked I came into the world and naked I shall return. I came in with nothing. I'm leaving with nothing. That my life is a, is a blip on the screen. It's just a, a vapor. It's, it's like a flower that springs in the morning with beauty, but then by the afternoon heat, it withers away. And, and that at the end of the day, I, I want it to be, I really do. I, wa- I want to be important. I want to be I want to be significant and substantial, but the truth is that I'm butt dust. And that takes a level of humility. You, do, you, do you know that physically, anatomically, the difference between you and the collection of, of the different parts of your physical body and, and, and dirt is essentially nothing. The same compounds that make up the dirt are the compounds that make up your body, the carbon, the the nitrogen, the hydrogen, all all those things. And that the sum total of all of those elements, if we broke them all down and sold them off for parts, if we sold you essentially for parts, you would be worth maybe about $3. I'm not saying you're worthless, but I'm just saying you're not worth much as the sum of your parts. Now you have infinite value, but your value is not inherent in your composition. Your value is determined not by by what you are, but by whose you are. Because at the end of the day, uh, a piece of art, I mean, the, the paint is worth very little. The canvas is worth very little. But But if a master painted it, it could be invaluable. 
that is a sum total. The value of the actual stuff is not much at all, but the fact that it was made by a master. So your value is immeasurable, but that's not a reflection of you. That's a reflection of him. Do you know, do you know the, the, the word uh, humility comes from the Latin root humus, which means earth or ground. Dust or dirt. It is also the root of the word human. Humility ought to be a quintessential quality of humanity. To be human ought to be having this awareness that I am but dust. That I came from nothing, I'm going to nothing. It doesn't mean I'm worth nothing, but it does, it does remind me in a world that where, where I want to I want to act like I'm gonna live forever, that I'm not. Where, 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 where honestly, I'm, I'm hyper-focused on this physical reality, on, on this collection of clay and what it looks like and trying to keep my clay from sagging too much or from, you know. I'm, I'm you know, if I'm be honest, I'm a little, I'm a little insecure today. Growing my hair out. I don't know if you can tell. Can you tell? You know, I've been wearing the fade for a while now. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, you know, I, you know, it's been a few years. I'm ready to switch it up a little bit. But I'm in that in-between state where it's just fuzzy. I'm trying to get it to lay down, but it won't lay down, right? And I'm, and I'm all wet. And so I'm like, I'm putting all this stuff in it, trying to make it, and it won't, and it won't do anything right now because it's just too short to do that, but it's too long to do anything else. And I'm all worried about my hair. At the end of the day, we are but dust. Don't be surprised if you look in the mirror and you're like, bro, I'm looking like some butt dust today. Like, you came from dirt, you're going back to dirt. I'm not trying to diminish, again, your value. I'm just trying to say, your value is not tied to you, it's tied to your relationship with him. And don't forget that. Humility, if I'm gonna hear from God, I gotta remember it's not about me, which, which leads us to the next point because, because the Bible says uh, that, that Jeremiah went down to the potter's house. He humbled himself and went, down, he got low, went to the potter's house, and I love this next phrase, and there he was. If you're writing down notes, just write down the word sovereignty, humility, because I know who I am and because I know who he is, because there is a God, I'm not him, but there is a God. There he was. I love the centrality of the person of the potter in the potter's house. And this is my hope. Listen, church, we ought to be a place that when people come, they can say, there he was. This should be a place where, where we are not on display, but he is on display. Where this isn't about the pots, this isn't about the jars, this isn't about the people, this isn't about the preacher, this is about the one for whom all of this exists. I'll be honest, you know, some people... If you don't know, we have multiple campuses, and sometimes I preach at different campuses. Like people are, sometimes people are like, is Pastor Tim going to be there? You're asking the wrong question. You should be asking, is he going to be there? Because if he's there, you can get everything you need. I might be there, but if he's not there, you can't get anything you need. But if he's there, nobody else can be there, and you can still have everything you need. There he was. Sovereignty, listen, sovereignty, sometimes we can assume that it means uh, this tendency of God or ability or willingness to God even to micromanage every detail of human existence. That we have no freedom, no choice. God is, uh, is pulling all the levers and making all the choices and, and, and human fr freedom and, and will are just, uh, are, are just uh, really uh, an imagination. God is the great micromanager. I don't think that's what sovereignty means, but what sovereignty I think really means here is that ultimately in the potter's house, listen, it's all, it all belongs to him. This is his house. These are his pots. The earth, the Bible says, is the Lord's and everything in it. It all belongs to him. It all came from him. It's all for him, and it's all going back to him. Again, you didn't, you didn't come with anything. You're not going to leave with anything. You're borrowing. Whatever you got, you're borrowing. Whatever you got, it's on loan. Whatever, whatever strength, whatever wisdom, whatever resources, whatever abilities, whatever relationships, everything in your life is temporary. God gave it to you for a minute. You're going to give it back before you're done. 
He is, at the end of the day, this is about him. And, and, and a lot of times we want, we, we want to believe that, you know, our stories, that we are the main character in our story. And the truth is that, that we are a part of a much bigger story that is his story. That history or his story, we, we get to play a part of it. But at the end of the day, this, this, it's, not, it's not about you, boo. And it's not about me because we're butt dust. And he is the sovereign creator of all things. And so, and so hearing from God means recognizing, uh, having the humility that it's not about me and it is about him. I went down to the potter's house and there he was. He's in the center of it all. It's all his. It's all about him. I love this though. It says, and there he was, but he's making something. Write down the word activity. And I love this because even though it's all his and it's all about him and it's all for him, he makes himself very much about us. The potter pours himself into his created work. That the, the God we see in the scriptures is not uh, an impersonal creator who just speaks it all into existence and steps back and watches as it all unfolds, but rather he stays intimately active in the life of his creation. That, that I love what the psalmist says. The psalmist in Psalm 139 says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. And what he's saying is that God has been working on you and in you and for you before you even showed up. God was already working in your life. Before you were born, he was was at work. Which means, which means not only was he working before you knew it, he's still working when you don't even, when you can't perceive it. Even when I don't see it, he's working. Even when I don't feel it, he's working. He's always, God never slumbers or sleeps. He's always, you're taking vacation, he's working. You're sleeping, he's working. He's always at work. So I got me some clay, which is just like, you know, juicy dust. <laughs> That's all clay is. It's some dust with some moisture in it. That's all it is. I got me some clay. And um, I thought we would, um, I thought we'd go to art class. I thought we'd try to make something. I've never really been a sculptor. But how hard could it be? I do know you gotta, gotta wet, wet the, get the fingers wet. And, and so he's making something at the wheels. Now, um, if, if you went to a, like a pottery shop, a modern pottery shop, you'd see, you'd see a pottery wheel. I don't got a pottery wheel. Um, but I do got this table that actually, in some ways, is more similar, similar to an ancient potter's wheel than a, a, a modern one. Because an ancient potter's wheel, back in like the you know, 5th century B.C., when Jeremiah's going and checking out the potter's house, um, it's got, he's working something at the wheel. And, and, and really, it's the wheels, plural. Now, 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 here's one thing to understand, because we're talking about God's activity in our lives. We're talking about how God works in our lives. He works at the wheels. Um, one thing that's important to understand is that God's activity in our lives is, is never linear. And I try to generally avoid things like always and never, but never, like never linear. God always works at the wheel. He always works in seasons and cycles and revolutions. Uh, one, of, uh, one of my favorite examples is the Bible says that when God led Israel out of Egypt, he did not lead them in the shortest route between Egypt and the Red Sea. Now, I told you we weren't going to math class, but let me take you to, back to geometry for just a second. You may remember that, that in geometry, we learned that the shortest path between any two points was a straight line, but he didn't lead them in a straight line. In fact, it goes on to say he led them in a roundabout way. So the way the potter works and brings transformation Formation and transformation into the clay is by putting it on the wheel and and the wheel turns and the clay turns and the potter applies pressure as the wheel turns and it creates this this, uh, this whatever shape that he or she wants to create. Um, But there's actually two wheels because just like this, there's, there's an upper wheel and then there's 
an axle that would connect it to a, a, a lower wheel. And so ancient potters would sit here and they would, they would work up at the upper wheel. They'd work with their hands. At the, on the lower wheel, though, they would actually they would kick the lower wheel with their foot to make the upper wheel turn. And so they would kick it and it would turn. And so, I mean, just imagine the level of, you know, dexterity and skill required to be like, I don't think I could do that. But what it communicates is that there are, there are some levels of God's activity that happen above the surface that I can see, I can feel, I can perceive. He's working in my life in ways that I can maybe perceive and even understand. But there are other things that God may be doing beneath the surface that I don't see, that I don't understand, that when I wonder, God, are you even here, that God might be working in ways. If God only works in ways that you understand, you are God. And we already have said this as a truth. You are not God. You are but dust. (laughs) As am I, right? His ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts, which means I'm not always going to understand his activity, which is why, by the way, the text says, and there he was making something, which means even in the activity of God, there is often uncertainty in me because I don't know. Sometimes I know he's doing something, but I don't know what he's doing. Sometimes, I, sometimes it just feels like I'm, he's just spinning me around. Right round, baby. Right, right, right. Like a record, baby. That's, and I'm just going in circles. Have you ever felt like you're going in circles? Could it be that God has you on the wheel and that there's purpose in the pathway that he's taking you, but I don't understand it? So the question is, when, when, when I don't understand the activity, do I still trust the heart of the potter? When I don't understand the process, can I trust the potter's heart? When, when I don't understand and see what his hands are doing, can I still trust his heart that he knows the plans that he has for me, plans to prosper me and not to harm me, to bring me a hope in the future? God, I don't understand what you're doing, but I believe that you will work all things together for good in my life. Even if it's not good, you're going to work it together for good. And so God is using the wheels. He's kicking the wheels and turning the wheels and, and working in ways that the pot, the, the, the pot can see in ways that the pot cannot see. Verse four goes on to say, it says, and, and then the, the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. If you're writing down notes, write down the word utility. We're halfway there. Utility. The vessel that he made of clay. We, we, to this point, we didn't know what he was making. He's making something. And I think sometimes that's the way we feel about God's activity in our lives. I, I, I know he's working, but I don't know what he's doing. I really wish I understood what God was up to. Making something. But now, all of a sudden, we have more clarity as to the final purpose that the potter has. He's making a vessel He's making a pot, which makes sense because he is a pot-er. <laughs> we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Like if you, if you take a verb and turn it into a noun, you, you can do that just by putting er on the end. <laughs> you know, a kick-er, a pot-er. I mean, just whatever, er. <laughs> uh, if you do it, like that person is by definition a person who does the thing. So a potter is by definition somebody who makes pots. Here's the point. God makes vessels. That's all he makes. The potter only makes pots. The, the, a potter does not make sculptures just to look at. He makes pots and vessels to use. Ephesians 2 says this concerning our work, God's workmanship in our lives. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. Oh, he made us to be pretty. He made us to be looked at. He made us to be set on a shelf. No, he created us anew in Christ Jesus. Why? So we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. 
We have function, we have purpose, we have utility, we have use, we have something that we were made to do. The potter makes pots. The potter, the potter doesn't make doodads, knickknacks. You know, the stuff that just sits on the shelves at your house or your granny's house. My granny Moore, my great granny Morris, she lived in Fitzgerald, Georgia. And her, she had the most knickknacks and, and, and two dads and all of these little, little ceramic things in her, the craziest, weirdest looking stuff. And we would go to her house in Fitzgerald and it would be filled. And all this stuff that you can't touch because it was, it was breakable and fragile and all this. No purpose other than to sit on the shelf. God does not make doodads. God makes pots. God makes people with purpose. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, he says, if anybody cleanses himself, he will become a vessel of honor, fit and useful to the master for every good work. Here's the question. Are you useful to God? You were made by God. If you're not the creator, you're the creation, period. It's creator or creation. Either you, 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 made, you made it all or you are one of the things that were made by the one who made it all. And if you were made by the one who made it all, then, then there is a purpose that the maker made it for. Are you fulfilling your purpose? Are you useful? This is like probably 20 years ago. I, I remember, um, uh, I'll never forget it. I went, um, Crystal and I just started dating and next month we'll celebrate our 18th anniversary. So this is probably almost, yeah, yeah. She has put up with me all these many years. So this is probably almost 20 years ago. And we, uh, we had just started dating. And she, her, her, she and her family lived in New York. That's, uh, that's where we met. And so I flew back up to New York. We just started dating. And it was the first time I was like really spending time with um, the family since we, we had met before and in group settings and stuff, but we had just started dating. And, and so it was kind of a, you know, kind of a big deal. And so I flew in in the, in the afternoon, early evening, and I got to her parents' house and they had a meal prepared, which was good because I was hungry. And uh, they said, all right, we got, you know, they're, they're, her family's Italian. So they had this big Italian spread. So we're getting ready to eat this big old meal, super hungry. And so we go to clean up and I'm washing my hands in the, in the sink, you know, getting ready for dinner and, uh, and, and, uh, and take some paper towels and I dry my hands off. I look over, her mom is like twitching. Like twitching. I thought she was having a seizure or something. I look at Crystal. I said, what's, I said, something's wrong with your mom. What's going on? She said, we don't use those paper towels. I said, what do you mean? She said, those paper towels are off limits. I said, what do you mean? She said, she says, those are the good paper towels. I said, well, good. It's good that they're good. That must mean that, they're, that they, they absorb a lot of liquid. They're good for cleaning things up and wiping somebody's wet hands. And what She said, no, 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 no. We don't use those paper towels. We use the paper towels underneath the sink. I said, oh, are those better for cleaning stuff up? She said, no, they're cheap and they hardly work. But those are the ones... We don't use the good paper towels. And, and what she meant by, I said, well, why, why are the, what makes the good ones good? She said, they got, they got purple grapes on them and my mom's got all these purple things in the, in the kitchen and it matches with, and so they're, they're, these, we don't use these because these are just to look at. I said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Why, and if you want to do that, why would you put them right by the sink and then be looking at me weird like I'm using paper towels to wipe my hand? Am I the only one who thinks this is crazy? It's just as crazy when believers think that their purpose is just to look good. Oh, oh no, we, we, don't, we don't use those. Oh, no, we don't serve. Oh, we don't give. Oh, we don't share the gospel. Oh, we don't do anything. We're just here to look good. No, you're not. You were made for a purpose. God don't make anything but pots. He makes vessels, which means he wants to fill you up and pour you out. Have you been filled up? Are you being poured out? And if not, you are not fulfilling your purpose. God has something for you to do. He's making a vessel. Of course he's making a vessel. It's all he makes. He's a potter. He going, a potter going to pot. He's going to pot some pots. He's going to make some pots. He's got pots everywhere. And, and you, I'm just telling you, you have no idea what God might want to put in you if you would just give yourself over to the purpose of the potter. 
God, use me. I don't know what you want me to do, but use me. I don't know who you want me to bless, but use me. Fill me up so you can pour me out. Put it in me so you, I, can, I can put it on somebody else. Bless me so I can be a blessing. I've got function and purpose and utility. The vessel, he's making, oh, he's making a vessel. Okay, okay, it looked like butt dust before, but now it's taking shape. Now he, he's had enough time with it. Now, I mean, they were, David said he, he got me out. He pulled me up out of the miry pit, out of the clay pit. Yeah, yeah, that's where he got me. He pulled me up out of the clay pit and he set me on a rock and established my goings. Is he not describing the process of the potter and so he's, wor- oh, oh, he's working. He's, oh, when I got, I, you know, I was, I was, I'll be honest, you know, before I came to Jesus, I was butt dust, but, but, but now God's working in my life and I came to elevate and I got on, you know, I, I got, I got, got saved and I, and I got in a small group and I even got on a serve team and I was finding my purpose and, and, and the vessel, oh, he's making a vessel and everything's going well. But the Bible says, and then the vessel that he was making out of clay was Marred, ruined, destroyed, literally is what it means, corrupted in the hand of the potter. All this progress, and now all of a sudden, if you're writing down words, write down the word adversity. We're almost done. Adversity. Here is the reality for every piece of clay. Every every piece of clay that you get, this one came from Amazon. They all... Because clay comes out of the ground. It is not a synthetic material. It's natural. Which means it has, all clay has imperfections in it. There is stuff in here that's not clay. And shouldn't be in here, but it is in here. Because it was in the dirt. And they filter it. And they get as much of it out as possible. To a certain degree where it shouldn't be a limiting factor for your ability to make this into whatever piece of artwork you wanna make. But the truth is all clay, all clay has internal imperfections. The truth is that all have sinned, that all we like sheep have gone astray. What adversity does, you know, a lot of times we're, I think, particularly concerned about Adversity about the hard things or the bad things in our lives. But one of the lessons I think from the potter's house is that what we should be far more concerned about than the adversity around us is the things that are going on inside of us. Because the thing that will make the clay implode, crack, break, crumble. It's not how hot the fire is. The clay, pure clay can withstand the kiln. It's when it has stuff in it. It shouldn't be in it. Which just means, listen, my greatest enemy is always the enemy in me. And I can blame people I can blame circumstances. I can blame adversities. I can blame what they did, what they said. I can blame all oh, the reason I the reason I cussed is because they cut out in front of me on 295. That's not why you cussed. You cussed because it's, that's what's in you. Out of the abundance of the heart, if it's not in you, it can't come out of you. When pressure is applied, this is how God transforms, but it's also the way we can be kind of deformed. Because when pressure is applied, whatever's on the inside comes out. When you get squeezed, adversity just squeezes you. And when all of us are squeezed, all we like clay. Clay gonna clay. Clay gonna crack. Clay gonna break. Clay's gonna do what clay's gonna do. Dust is gonna do what dust is gonna do. Humus is gonna do what humus is gonna do. Humans are gonna do what humans are gonna do. Which means all of us are going to mess up, break down make mistakes, sin, reject the will of God and plan of God for our lives, all of those things. It's inevitable. So here's the human condition. Amazing utility and shocking fragility at the same time. Great purpose 
at the same time, I've got purpose and I've got problems. And some of us think, well, when I get done with my problems, I'm gonna walk in my purpose. That's not the way it works. Because as long as you are clay, you're gonna have problems. But in the New Testament, the Bible says that God puts immeasurable treasure, he chooses to put that into clay pots. When we break down, I don't know about you, at some point, if I keep working with clay and clay, clay keeps breaking and cracking, I'm gonna move to a different medium. I'm gonna go to like titanium or something. Something a little stronger, something more durable, something that doesn't break. But this text finishes by saying the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he threw it away. No. He traded in for something better. No. He gave up on digging in the dirt and pulling out clay and thinking that he could make something. No. He made it again. Write down the word tenacity and we're gonna go home. Tenacity is the unwillingness to give up. Tenacity is the ability to over and over again be met with adversity and keep going. I'm not talking about your ability to be met with adversity and keep going. I'm talking about God's ability to put and pour himself into your life, to teach you, guide you, instruct you, save you, fill you with his spirit, make you into a vessel, pour into you, only to have you implode again, go back to the addiction again, give up on faith again, fall and fail again. And God has a choice over and over. And God's choice is always the same. And he even says, Israel, here's the message, Israel. Can I not do with you what this potter does with this clay? Is it not within my, my options as the potter to make a choice? Yeah, I could start all over. I could, I could scrap it. I could go to, and do something else. Or if I really wanted to, I could do it again. I could make it again. I could forgive them again. I could redeem them again. I could restore them again. I could put my hand on them again. I could anoint them again. I could raise them up again. Israel, I know, I know you think it's over because, because it, it got ruined. I mean, the word marred means completely destroyed. Not like messed up a little bit, like completely leveled. Like your marriage is done. Your mental health is done. Your finances, destroyed. And you think that's the last word. Notice though, in the middle of the adversity, notice the proximity of the clay to the potter. The Bible says it was marred in his, I think that some of us think that if we fail, he must be far. But this text shows us that when we fail, we're still in his hands. I don't know who needs to hear this, but he has not discarded you. He is not far from you. That even in your failure, your implosion, even in your worst mistake, he keeps his hands on your life and he never gives up on what he called you to be. And I know it might not look like something right now, but God says, when I'm done, I don't know about you, but I think that's a pretty good bowl right there. I like what Paul says. He says, being confident of this one thing. He said, I'm sure, if I'm not sure about anything else, I'm sure of one thing, that he who began a good work in you, he who started, if I started making a pot, I'm not going to finish until it's a pot. If I started making a righteous son or daughter of God, I'm not done until I'm done. And you might be ready to give up, but God is not giving up. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance, which means he doesn't change his mind. I know the thoughts that I think 
concerning you. I know the plans that I've made for you, says Lord. Jeremiah 29, 11. It's the same word. I know what I got planned for you. And yeah, it's going to get bad, but that doesn't mean it's going to ever make me quit on what I started in your life. So here's the good news of the gospel. Listen, as we finish, here's the good news of the gospel. Every one of us who makes it, who becomes what God's called us to be, and ultimately what God has called you to be is like Jesus. He, he preordained that we would be conformed into the image of his son, Jesus. Conformed. He's not just any pot. It's a Jesus-shaped vessel. You, your destiny, if you are in Christ, is that you will be made into Christ. God is making you that when he's done with you, I know he's not done with you, but when he's done, you will be formed, fully formed into the image of Jesus. You will look just like Jesus when he's done. Some of us, he got a lot of work. All of us, he got a lot of work because we're butt dust. But he has decided to take dust and give it destiny. And when we become what he wants us to be, and when we are there, and when we stand in eternity in the presence of our God, there will not be one of us who is there because they were perfect. All of us who are there will be there because he was persistent. Because he never gave up. He never stopped working. He said, no, I'm not done. No, that's not the last word. No, that doesn't get to have the last word in your life. I'm not finished until my work is complete. And if you can believe that, it means that even the worst things in your life cannot be the final things in your life. Because the final thing in your life is that you are who God called you to be. If he started it... He has never started something and not finished it. And he's not going to start with you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace today. We thank you for that word. There's some of us today that we need a new start. We need to believe that you are able and more so that you are willing to make us over again. Ah, but I tried this faith thing before. God's probably tired of this, me stepping in and then pulling out, me starting down this journey and then for some reason turning around, me, me, me getting saved and then not really following through. Surely he's tired of me taking one step forward and two steps back. No, he never gives up. He is patient and long-suffering and he makes it again and he makes it again and he makes it again and maybe you're here today and you need God to do it again. You're in the right place. You're in the potter's house. And if you just surrender your life to him, if you just let him put his hand back on your life and begin to work back in your life, no matter where you've been or what you've done, it does not have the last word. So come on, right where you are, if that's you, and you need to receive that today. Pray, that, pray this in your heart right now while I pray it out loud right now. Father, we thank you that you have a plan for us that you are completely committed to, that you will never give up on. Even when we've given up, you haven't given up. Today, God, we believe, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. Not because of the content of ourselves, but of the character of the one who made us, called us, saved us, and is transforming us into what we ought to be. Start again, God. Our lives are in your hands. You are the potter. We are the clay. Make us, form us, change us, use us for the glory of God and for the good of others, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.